Ever wonder with your host, Mike Holtman? It's the podcast that will answer your questions about many of the things in life we've always wanted to know more about. Our guests, experts in their chosen field, will enlighten us about subjects ranging from real estate, business, career, science, philanthropy, and much more. Proudly presented by Hallmark Abstract Service, it is once again time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride on our information superhighway. And now, here's Mike Holtman. Yes. Hello, everybody. I am Mike Holtman. I am the not only the CEO of Hallmark Abstract Service, but I am also, I have the honor of being your host and uh, leading this discussion that today I think everyone's going to find very interesting. So today I'd like to start off with a stat. And it's a stat that I really didn't know about until uh, about seven years ago when I became involved with uh, with the foundation started by one of our guests. And that statistic is that each and every day, 20 plus veterans, military veterans die by suicide. It's a, uh, it's a tragic, tragic statistic. And yet there we are. And then one of our, Judy, who I will introduce in a few minutes, has a foundation that specifically addresses that subject. And our other guest, Steve Bucci, he's also, he's got a, a background that, that brings him right into the forefront of, the, of this topic. So, you know, the last two years have been very difficult for a lot of us, but for veterans in particular, COVID, the depression, the anxiety, the loneliness has only exacerbated what was already a very significant issue for, for veterans who come home suffering with PTSD, with moral injury, with, with invisible wounds. You know, we all know about visible wounds. You know, we see commercials, we see a lot of things that cover visible wounds, but you don't often see a lot that covers invisible wounds. And that's really what we're going to cover today, which is moral injury and, uh, and PTSD. So another statistic is the fact that, and I, I got this from an article written by Steve Bucci, over the last 10 years, and now more than 10 years, the federal government has had well over 1,100 programs dedicated to helping our suffering veterans. But the fact of the matter is that those programs have likely not been as effective as they could be because the statistic of 20 plus veterans dying each and every day by suicide really hasn't changed much. So, so what's missing from what the government tries to do? And one glaring issue that's missing from what the government tries to do is faith. So the government, uh, I suppose it's a constitutional separation of church and state. Uh, is that the constitution? I'm not 100% sure. Yes, it is. So that's why my understanding is that they don't really approach it. But it, it, as we will find out in a couple of minutes, it seems to be one of the most, if not the most effective tools to use when trying to fight this, this tragedy. So the first guest I'd like to introduce is Judy Elias. Judy Elias is the founder of the Heroes to Heroes Foundation. I met Judy probably about seven years ago, sitting in a business club in New York City. I asked her what she was doing. She started telling me about Heroes to Heroes Foundation. And I said, I need to get involved with that. And uh, seven yeah. years later, here I am still involved and still helping as much as I can. And Judy is a tireless force, as much as I can push the mission forward. So the mission, just to briefly cover it, is Heroes to Heroes works with combat veterans who return home suffering with moral injury. And the program is based in spirituality, peer support, and reconnection to faith. So it, it really focuses on a, a lot of things that the government doesn't focus on. And you know it's been incredibly effective so far. And Hopefully it'll be effective well into the future. So welcome, Judy. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Steve. Well, um, that was, 
Well, let me just get to this to our second guest. And uh, I don't know, doctor? Is you no. go by doctor? Okay. <laughs> Dr. Steve Bucci is a visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation. And among some of the other things that he is expert in, he also, and, and what brought me to reach out to Steve, he, he ran a, uh, a round table on, on PTSD, uh, veteran suicide, and faith. And it, it seemed like a, the synergies were, were too great to ignore. So I, I thank you, Steve. So I had a, I had a question for you, but first let's, let's uh, have our two guests say a couple of words, Judy. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, working with moral, moral injury is a challenge. And I think the first thing we need to do is come up with a working definition so people who are listening understand. And the best way to really define moral injury from is doing is when you're asked to do or forced to do something that is against your ethical or moral code, um, which goes into moral injury. Uh, and a good example I'm going to take from one of our veterans. Uh, Stephen was in Afghanistan and his unit was ambushed. And one of the insurgents pointed a weapon at his battle buddy. And Stephen had a split second to make a decision, save the life of his battle buddy or eliminate the insurgent you know, or let the insurgent, you know, he had to deal with it by eliminating the insurgent. Well, he did the, made the right choice, eliminated the, the insurgent, and then found out that that insurgent was 10 years old. Now, in Western culture, our culture, that's a child. And that insurgent's father put the weapon in, in his son's hand. Okay, now Stephen had to come home and live with that and had to come home and hug his family and pretend he was back to civilian life. And when he, he came to us after four suicide attempts and his father called and said, I'm gonna lose my child. Would you, could you please help? You're the last hope. And so, you know, number one, to take a look at Stephen's moral injury when he finally could speak about it, he said that that young boy visited him every night in his sleep. And that's an intense moral injury. And our veterans, we, you know, we talk about war, you know, we're watching this war on television in the Ukraine and we're seeing the civilian casualties and the pain and hearing the story. And we assume that the soldiers doing that causing it can just get up and walk away right. you know maybe putin can get up and walk away he's not doing anything except directing it but no. his soldiers are people are humans with hearts and absolutely you know so that's I mean, to take a look at the moral injury aspect of what we send our soldiers to do and what we're seeing in the ukraine there's plenty to go plenty plenty to go around absolutely so steve let me ask you a, a question so you spent 30 years uh in army special forces and i'm imagining during those 30 years you spent some time in uh, on the battlefield yes so as somebody uh, i mean i never served and i don't think judy ever served uh so as someone who served who was in the who was in the thick of it, who was in, in the battle, do you understand, I mean, can you, can you really, can you understand why, how people get affected so seriously and significantly? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, exactly what Judy described there is a very common uh, occurrence, particularly when you're fighting in a counterinsurgency type fight, big conventional battles, you don't even often see who it is you're shooting at and who you're killing. It's, it's done at great distances. And this kind of moral injury still occurs there. But in a counterinsurgency environment, 
where you have children fighting, you have women fighting, uh, you, you have situations that don't fit what we've been taught as the, you know, the, the way war is supposed to occur. It's a very dirty, intense, personal, up close kind of activity. So your possibility of having this sort of moral injury just goes up astronomically. Uh, and we've had, uh, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan, the war was not fought just by our special operators who are trained specifically in this type of warfare. We, we threw all of our conventional forces, our young men and women in regular units who had just enlisted you know, went through basic training, advanced training, and then were sent into the fight uh, into this kind of warfare. It causes a, a, a huge increase in this type of situation, which leads to the huge increase in the kind of moral injury that, that Judy's referring to. Uh, it's real. Uh, it, it's not some moral deficiency on the part of the person who suffers it. In fact, the, the people who suffer these wounds are the more normal people. You know, it, it's what's real in a human being. We're not supposed to kill each other. That, that's not, you know, what humans do naturally. It, some people do, and they're either considered, you know, sociopaths, so they, they have no guilt for anything they do, uh, or as one uh, expert in this, uh, call that you're either a sociopath or you're a hero. Uh, and because some people can put those things aside to do what needs to be done to protect their buddies, to, to accomplish the mission without that moral injury, but they're pretty darned exceptional. Uh, so this is a real thing. It, it's out there. You know, we fought for almost 20 years in those two battlefields. Uh, a lot of troops over that time period have been involved in this face-to-face, close-up, uh, very ambiguous kind of warfare. So naturally, you're going to see a lot of these kind of injuries, which has led to this incredibly you know, resistant pace of, of suicide or at least you know, guys turn into alcohol, to, to drugs. Uh, who are walking away from their families, who suddenly become abusive of their families when that wasn't there before. All of those things are symptoms of this kind of moral injury. And we as a country have a responsibility to find a way to minister to these young men and women. And the hard part about it is there's not one treatment for it. It's what works with one person or one group of people has absolutely no positive effect on the next one. So that's why you see a lot of this multitude of programs, right? because we don't know what's going to work. So we keep right. trying all sorts of things. Well, I think one thing we have found that seems to work, and it, you know, the Heroes to Heroes Foundation mission is, is actually being studied by a, a, a Dr. Joseph Currier, who's in, are you, are you familiar with him, Steve? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... And he's he's finding great efficacy with the program, but the way you described the alcoholism, the uh, the loss of spouse, the loss of family, Judy talks about those things all the time, and it's uh, I mean the same consistent problems run through it all, and you're 100 percent right that something something does need to be determined, and and some things that work take a lot of money to to recreate. So I know the Heroes Here Heroes Foundation so far has sent over 300 vets to Israel. And my question to you, Judy, is who reaches out to Heroes to Heroes? Is it the vet? Is it the family? Does it vary? Very good question. It's a combination. Um, we have even had a VA therapists reach out to us um, and refer patients. Uh, we often hear from family members, parents who are terrified to lose their children, uh, spouses, children. Uh, we've had children of Vietnam vets, children of National Guard, guardsmen and women. 
uh, reach out to us and say, my mom, my dad, I'm in, they're in trouble. And, um, and the vets themselves hear from other vets. Uh, often we are a vet, an organization of last resort. You know, what we do, and I think it's important that people understand is we cut, we cut to the chase. We talk about faith, we talk about forgiveness. We talk about finding peace, finding forgiveness, teaching them how to forgive themselves and straight ahead. One of the questions that you know Dr. Currier asks on the survey prior to their acceptance on the program is, what do you think God thinks of you? Now, it's probably something we should all ask ourselves on a regular basis. Uh, yet when our about 80% of the veterans who take part in our program will say something along the lines of, God wishes I were dead. Now, if you're waking up in the morning and that's your first thought, or that's in your head, because we talk to ourselves more than we talk to anyone else, and that's part of your communication with yourself. How do you get back into your family? And traditional therapy does not address it. You know, God is not part of that. And now the average American has about a third grade level of understanding of their faith. Okay, Christians, Jews, Muslims, whoever you are, people understand this is it's black and white. You, you have the 10 or the seven commandments, seven Noahide laws, whatever it is. If you, if you transgress on one of them, you're bad. Okay, so you have people who have been church going, family going, but not getting the education. And it's all faiths. They get sent to war. They're believers, but they don't understand the gray area of the relationship with their creator. So the first thing they do think is, I'm a murderer, look what I've done. Maybe they took something from a body to protect themselves or from someone and I've stolen, I've killed, and they, they add this up. But they were not taught through their faith how to reconnect that you can still, you know, God doesn't put you in a position that he wants you to fail in. Okay. We don't, the first thing our veterans learn when they go on the heroes to heroes program is your number one responsibility is to stay alive. That's how you, that's how you respect your connection to your creator. As long as you're alive, you can pray, you can do good deeds, you can do all the things that are asked of you. So getting them to start accepting that they can have that relationship. Traditional therapy, going fishing, going hiking, they're great. They're great R&R. &R. But I always wonder, what are we doing in R&R &R when we're sending them with a case of beer, go fishing? Then they go back to emptiness and then we have a suicide rate of 20 plus a day. We're not changing it. Everything are we, you know, getting to the root, getting to the soul. We've got to heal souls here and teach people how to accept the relationship with their creator, the relationship with each other, the relationship with their spouses, how to navigate a civilian world. And, you know, our first year of the program we're building this part of the program now because we realized we desperately needed it, is when they come home, how do you navigate the civilian world? A soldier leaves, the soldier changes, their values change, what they've learned change, their whole world is flipped upside down. In the meantime, their family is going along. They may become more resilient, but ultimately the family isn't changing that much. They're aging, they're learning, they're becoming more resilient at the same, but same time the soldier goes off and he's totally changing. 
the person his, his or her spouse married is not the person who comes home. So number one, we've realized through our years of um, study and watching going through our program is the first thing we have to do is connect them with that change. Let them understand what were you, do you remember those values? Who were you when you left? Now, who are you? What are your values now? How do you work with it? How do you navigate the civilian world? How do you not get angry when you're standing in line? And so, you know, we found that the first year in our program, which is now a three-year program, is that self-exploration, the real stuff with each other and peer support is key. So Steve, you can see uh, Judy's passion for the, for the mission. Uh, incredible she's a she really is a guiding force for the heroes to heroes foundation but I, I know that when you had your round table you had two conclusions at the end and i i believe they both revolved revolved around, around faith and whether government will ever accept i mean you mentioned something about an executive order you know will government ever accept faith as a solution to a serious problem instead of just dancing around the edges and really not accomplishing much of anything? Well, uh, I, I sure hope so. We did at the end of that uh, round table, that was our conclusion that uh, while a faith-based program, you know, you can't force that on people, you can't mandate that, not in a system like ours, but to not have it available, to not make that one of the options. And I'm not talking about you know, an evangelical one, or, I mean, you can have any faith there because it has to match with what the individual, if the kid's Jewish, you want to have a Jewish faith-based program. If a kid is, is a Muslim, you want a Muslim-based one. I'm not talking about debating the relative efficacy of the different faiths, but you have to touch that soldier where they are, are based, where they're coming from, uh, and, and you have to have that available. We have chaplains in our military all over the place. But when it comes to this kind of therapy uh, and, and um, programs for the, the troops, the government is, well, you know, we, 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 you know, they're willing to try anything. We got programs with people playing with raptors, you know, eagles and hawks. We got horseback riding. We got fly fishing. We got skiing. And I'm not denigrating any of those things because if that if that Raptor program helps one kid, it's worth the money we invested in the silly program. You know, not not that it's silly, but it's you know that at idiosyncratic program. I saw a kid with a skiing program that uh, was one of the first one of these that was started for the amputees, and this guy looked like Lieutenant Dan. I mean, he had lost both his legs. His hair was down below his shoulders, big, long beard. He was smoking weed all the time. He was drunk. And his wife came to us. We were there kind of helping with the program. And, and she was in a panic. She, she said, I'm losing him. First, he lost his legs. Now I'm losing his soul. What can we do? Well, he got in this program. They matched him up with this little bitty lady who is in the uh um, adaptive skiing hall of fame. She had lost the use of her legs in a, in a car accident. And she got up there on that hill with this guy and just ripped his face off and told him, stop feeling sorry for himself. You need to get out of this hole. And over the course of a week, this guy's whole life turned around. And when we came back the next year, he's got his hair cut. He's clean shaven. He's now an instructor in this. Wow. doing races professionally. I mean, it changed his life. That's not going to work for everybody, but for him, it did. The, so we have to have these faith-based programs because they work. And trust me, I'm, I'm a person of faith. I think that's what we should go to first, frankly. But in a government like ours, I don't think we're ever going to get there, but we darn sure got to get away from this reluctance to go anywhere near faith-based things because we're worried you know somebody like like mikey weinstein the guy out in colorado is going to sue us because 
he doesn't want to see faith anywhere. Right. We need to have those things available because for a large number of these kids, maybe even the majority, that faith-based program is going to be the thing that really changes them and gets them through to the other side. So is, is political correctness a huge issue? A hundred percent. That's one of the reluctance from our Congress people and our senators and from depending on who's in, in the White House, from the administration. Well, you know, we really don't want to go there because that will get people Depends. upset. Right. Yeah, that that's nonsense. I don't care who's offended. We need to find a way to minister to these young people who have been damaged doing the bidding of our nation. So and, and been, that's the way to do it. And like I, you know, I, I'd like to take it one step further and I'd like to teach faith resilience before they go to war. And I think that's a big, you know, we bring these kids in and some adults, we have our suicide rate among 18 to 24 year olds and teenagers is a crisis. Okay, it's off the charts. Now, one of the things we do at Heroes to Heroes when the veterans come back, we speak on college campuses. They, they tell their stories. We wanna speak to students and get students to understand what these veterans do and why they have their freedom, why their liberty is so important and who the people are that are out there making it happen. And we were in Champaign-Urbana you know, and there were about 75 students in the room. And, you know, we was one of our first and I was doing a training. And the first thing I asked was how many of you know a veteran or a soldier? Maybe five people. We told the ROTC, four people from ROTC, you can't answer this. Maybe five people raised their hand. I asked the same group of people, how many of you have known someone who has died by suicide, 100%, okay, 75 plus people. And I said to them all, when I was your age, it was the opposite. I don't think anyone knew anyone who died of suicide. We didn't even think about it. It wasn't part of our world. And we have taken faith away. We've taken foundation. We've given our children little to nothing. And then we send them to war. And how do they heal? You know, the, whole, the old adage, you know, there are no atheists in foxholes. But what is that relationship? Is that relationship strong enough to get through that foxhole? And what we're seeing now, it isn't. And how do we get that information to them before they go? How do we teach them? How do we make that part of it? I spoke to a group of military chaplains and you know, gave them some tools to use. And over and over, you know, they said to me, well, we're not supposed to talk about God. You know, I'm a Jewish chaplain, they're Christians. I said, we work with everyone. We use the word God, that's universal. Everyone has to find their own, within their own faith, within their own space to find that forgiveness and peace. And it's giving them what they need and opening, but it's not discussed. And one of the first things we do during a team in Israel, one of their first assignments is sit down and write a letter to God. In your language, if you're a first language is, is Spanish, write it in Spanish, but write that letter, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Get it out there. Are you happy? Are you angry? What are you happy about? What are you angry about? Have start that conversation. And when I did it with the chaplains, one of the chaplains said to me, I pray every day and I've never done this. And I have a lot more to write. And I can't believe what I'm writing. And it's it's how we start that time in their 10 day journey in Israel and their one year program of reconnecting to faith. But it's so powerful, but I would say it's gotta be done before. Well, let me, Steve, let me ask you a question. So 
in the in the couple of years since you had that roundtable, what has Heritage looked deeper into the issue of of uh, death by suicide, faith, those those issues? Uh, they have been engaged with several of the other folks that were in that uh, roundtable there uh, with trying to get that executive order. We were trying to get the president at the time, President Trump, to sign an executive order that mandated that the the VA and the military itself allow faith-based ministries to be a part of these programs, to at least be on the menu uh, of what's available for, for young folks who come back and who have this sort of moral injury. Uh, in many cases, they've got physical injuries as well. Uh, and we made a lot of progress, and then we had an election. Uh, and, and now uh, those things have all been pushed aside again. We've returned to that uh, political correct uh, view, as, as Judy referred, the chaplains, you know, who when, when I was a young officer, the chaplains could do anything they wanted to. They could go anywhere they wanted to. The Catholic priest wasn't nervous about ministering to the Jewish kids or the Protestant kids. They were all their kids. And the same thing if you had a, if you had a rabbi who was your chaplain, he took care of everybody. That is really difficult now. Many of these folks who have very strong faiths, the chaplains, I mean, some chaplains are kind of wishy-washy, frankly, yeah. but most of, most of them, you know, arrive with, you know, with a feeling of mission and calling to minister to these soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines uh, in, in the right way. And they're told now, you know, you can't say this and you can't say in the name of Jesus. Well, if they're, they're doing a Baptist service because they're a Baptist minister, you're supposed to be allowed to, to use your doctrine in that service. When you're ministering separately, you're doing counseling, then you have to be a little more ecumenical, but it doesn't mean you have to hide who you work for. You know, you're not, God doesn't get left at the door when a chaplain's doing counseling, but they have the chaplains so fearful that they're going to have their credentials pulled if they go beyond, you know, the, the idea of, you know, the great spirit in the sky kind of thing. Uh, and that's not effective. If, if a chaplain, regardless of their denomination, isn't allowed to operate from the base of faith that they then became a minister uh, to, to pursue, they have no power in their ministry. So let me and, ask you, so just not to, I, I apologize for interrupting, but we have a huge problem and we're relying to a large extent on the federal government to help shepherd through this huge problem. Unless the federal government changes its stripes, then how do we, what's the end game? Well, how do we how do we resolve this issue, or is it just going to be another talking point for, you know, for the for the senators? We need to deal with veteran suicide. You know, we got to do what we got to do. We got to it's we know we have to do it. You know, all of the rhetoric and uh, platitudes that they say every day. Uh, I, I would say it's a talking point. Uh, you know, I've been asked by, I can't tell you how many people, they want photo ops with the vets. They want to come to our events. Oh, they'll have a meeting with me. And um, I'm not shy. Uh, this is what we do. This is what we found. This is what I believe. And I will get one meeting and then I'll be put on their mailing list. And that's so, what it is. And so the funding of, goes to horses and yoga and. So what level of advocacy is it going to take? What level of. I mean, it's not lobbying. It's not what 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 is the conduit by which the federal government actually does something to help our veterans? Well, uh, I and some people are going to say, oh, no, this never works. But the citizens have to engage with their legislators. They have to badger those people. They have to write to them. They have to email them. They have to call them. Those folks, even the most hardened, you know, vain politician out there, if their constituents are raising enough of a stink about an issue, 
they will respond because they they connect those ticked off citizens with votes. And that's what motivates them. Uh, So so. we we've got to do that. We and if somebody doesn't respond, then you need to get involved in the campaign against them and let people know that Congressman Blowhard refused to even respond to this issue and and let that power of the ballot box take effect. So it sounds like what you're asking people to do is to become engaged, to get off their ass, to actually take a stand, to do something other than thinking about themselves and to really go out and advocate for something that truly matters. That's uh, that's the game. A hundred percent and support organizations like Judy's either financially or volunteer to help uh, get involved in the ministries or the organizations that are providing this kind of, of therapy and help and support. It's not cheap. You know, she's talking about a three year program for these folks. I know they're not charging the wounded veterans. Uh, so somebody has got to pay for this stuff. The government may help a little, maybe they don't help at all. They but, don't you know, at all. Not a thing. Yeah. So you, you have to support them. And, you know, I mean, if nothing else, pray for them and, and support them that way. That's, that's not without power, I can tell you. Uh, you've got to get involved. Sitting back and complaining about a problem is not an answer. That's an excuse. So we're running out of time, but I can say from my perspective, if the Heritage Foundation needs help, and has an initiative that they need help with, I, I would be more than happy to help. And, uh, you know, and again, Judy's, what is Judy's a driving force in, in saving, saving these men and women. And it's, you know, I just hope that at some point, the federal government, the powers that be, lose their fear of doing something that might annoy someone. That might that might tick someone off. That they might lose a vote or two. You know, maybe term limits. But that's a whole other. I've kind of stepped out of that sphere because I feel you know I have to save lives, and I don't have time to wait weeks, days. You know, right now I have one of my vets texted me to call someone who's going through a rough time. I don't. I can't wait twenty four hours. Nevertheless, trying to you know turn this whole government on a dime. Um, I think it's gonna take organizations, first of all, getting together instead of competing with each other, working together, all the, the, the organizations that work in the faith space. We're not really a faith-based organization because we are anyone of faith, um, but to work together. You know, the Heritage Foundation is working on it. I would love to know what the Heritage Foundation is doing and how have the Heritage Foundation look at our program. Our program is working for so many people. So maybe, you know, we can take these programs, let's sift through them, let's see what's working and stop just funding what we love and what's easy, but start Mm -hmm. looking at what's working. And I think that's what's happened. I when I was... I almost closed Heroes to Heroes when I saw that $10 million was going to yoga. And I said, there are yoga studios all over the country. Can't we just give spaces to veterans in every yoga studio and you know whatever it is? But I'm going, there are, yoga does help and it saves a lot of people. But we have all these organizations, many of them small, that are doing amazing things but we are not going to be able to survive right? because I knock on doors. Mike, you knock on doors. Well, and that's speaking, what our... Speaking of knocking on doors, Judy, how can, how can people find you? Okay. You can find us through here. It's called heroes to heroes.org. H-E-R-O-E-S-T-O-H-E-R-O-E-S.org. I'm Judy, J-U-D-Y at heroes to heroes.org. Our phone number is 201-851-2409. Um, we you. need volunteers, especially people who have military moral injury experience that to lead our teams, um, getting people involved, clergy. Uh, we, we're looking for volunteers, donations, 
desperate for too. Um, but we also are looking for program specialists to help us realize the full program and publishing. There's so many ways to get involved. So um, for anyone who listening to this, who has an interest in helping, reach out to Judy, reach out to me. And Steve, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, they can get a hold of me at stephen.bucci at heritage.org, S-T-E-V-E-N dot B-U-C-C-I, just like Gucci, only with a B, uh, at heritage.org, and uh, or go to, to uh, the website at heritage.org uh, and you know look for the, the research there. There's been a lot of stuff written. Uh, you know, write to them, say, hey, we want to see more of this. Can you guys help with this? Uh, and it's, you know, heritage covers lots of issues. This is one of them. Uh, but, you know, get involved. If, if you don't want to work with Judy's organization, find one locally that's doing this kind of thing. As she says, this is not a competition. There's a lot of people out there who need this kind of support. So we're going to, you know, we're, we run out of ministries long before we run out of people who need them. So find one that you want to work with, that you're comfortable with, work with them, support them financially, uh, provide just the, the manpower to get things done. Uh, it's critical. People's lives are literally at stake here. And, uh, and there are people who got in this condition because our nation sent them to serve us. Right. We owe them that. And you know, uh, I couldn't have said it any better. Yeah. I couldn't have ended it any better. And I'd love to have the two of you back because I think what you two have to say is incredibly valuable. And, you know, I hope people are listening. And thank you both for coming. It was, I, uh, it was a great conversation. Thanks for having us. Of course. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Do You Ever Wonder? And if there's a subject that's always been on your mind, let us know. We hope you'll join us next time for the show that answers your questions. And please like and share this episode with your friends and on your social media. See you next time. Well, thank you, Steve. It was so nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you as well. Thank you for what you're doing. Really.